keep moving here through our events as we've got creation. Fall, and we're at the flood, and we have to get to Babel. And I hope to be able to get to that this next session and move on into the book of Job. We won't be doing much in Job, just a quick overview of what the book is about. And so we can move on into the four key people of Genesis. We're still dealing with the four key events. So we're on the bottom of page 16. I stopped there just so this give us a good review of some things of what we see here as we make this New Testament connection to Noah and the flood. As Peter points out in 2 Peter 2.5, Peter called Noah preacher of righteousness. And the only thing I really know to do with that is that during the time when he's building the ark, he's proclaiming, hey guys, judgment's coming. You need to believe you need to get on the boat with us. And he was preaching the righteousness of God during that time and had no converts. Now in today's society, we would call that an unsuccessful ministry. But in God's eyes, it's successful because he was faithful. That's what a successful ministry is. It's not the numbers, not the resources, but it's the faithfulness to God. And that's what Noah was. He was faithful. Noah proclaimed... Justification by faith alone. That's what I think in being a preacher of righteousness as Peter calls him that. And again, no converts, no takers. Closest one might be Methuselah, but he dies the year of the flood. I think Methuselah was a believer. Noah's walk included proclaiming the gospel. So he's got his own kind of great commission aspect there, I guess. With again, no converts taking place and then as we pointed out this in Hebrews eleven seven, 7 the author says that Noah did what he did by faith and he gained an inheritance it was something different than just his positional uh, righteousness it was something beyond that it was a faith obedience that gained an inheritance or reward from walking with God. It was his close walk with the Lord. And we have that in the New Testament as well. The rewards at the judgment seat of Christ based upon uh, our walk with the Lord. There's also a loss at the same place based upon not walking with the Lord. Alright, so now in Genesis 6, 11 through 8, 22, we have the flood. In Genesis 6, 11 through 12, mankind had become so corrupt, as we read last hour, filled with violence, that God had to do something about it. And so in verse 13, he said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence because of them, and behold, I'm about to destroy them with the earth. So God announced doom on the unrighteous people of the world. And yet, Noah is going to be a preacher of righteousness during this time. Verses 14 through 16, God gave Noah the exact dimensions or size of the ark. He tells him what to build it out of, the gopher wood. Tells him how to seal it. Thompson's water seal of the ancient world. The, the pitch that he used to put on it to make it waterproof. And the size of this thing. This thing is huge. No matter what you do with a cubit, whether you make a cubit 16 inches or 13 inches, 21 inches, it's still big. God's instructions are always precise and clear. Imagine what would happen... If Noah allegorized this thing. You know, the Lord really didn't mean, I mean, it's only the eight of us. And we just got the family dog. So, you know, really, do we need this huge old boat? And so he builds something more of a nice, you know, comfortable but sizable uh, yacht, if you will. And then all the animals start showing up on that day that God brings the animal. What's he going to do then, see? He had to follow the precise instructions. And to follow precise instructions requires a precise hermeneutic, not some sort of spiritualized thing. So the dimensions of the ark, and when these are both in meters and, and uh, feet, so uh, I have to put everything in feet and inches because in, in miles, but the rest of the world operates on the metric system. So the dimensions of the ark, 133.5 meters or 438 feet long, 22.2 meters or 72.9 feet wide, and 13.3 meters or 43.8 feet high made it seaworthy. It's basically a big old bar just going to sit low in the water. 
that can't be toppled. It, it can't be turned. It's not going to be turned over this way. It's not going to be turned over this way. It's got to withstand the eruption of the waters and just float. He doesn't have to steer it. doesn't have to do anything but just rest in God's provision of this big ark. The ark had 8,825, what's that, metric tons, 95,000 square feet on three decks for a total volume of 1,396,000 cubic feet. In other words, it's big. The one door on the ark was the only means of entering and exiting. There was only one access point, and that's going to be important here in just a little bit. But let's look at this, this picture here of a drawing of the ark and kind of get an idea of the size. Here's how big it is in, in, a, in a, uh, just a picture, but here it is on the scale. 437 feet long. Here's a 747. This is the size of your average brontosaurus. This is the size of a giraffe and an elephant, 44 feet high. So an elephant and a giraffe could fit on one deck. And it didn't have to have the head out the top like you see in all the little kids' pictures. Uh, they, they were totally contained in this thing. So it's just one big box. And they've done a lot of different uh, computer models and tests and how this thing would keep itself aright and afloat as it sits low with the ballast and the way it's set up. God knew what he was doing, what it boils down to. And Noah, to survive, had to follow the exact precise instructions. Genesis 6, 17-18, God promised Noah deliverance from the flood judgment. He said, Behold, I am even going to bring the flood of water upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life from under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall perish. But I will establish my covenant with you. And you shall enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. So God promised to deliver Noah and his family. God communicated Noah, God commanded Noah to put animals and food on the ark. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every kind into the ark to keep them alive with you. They should be male and female. Now it's two of every kind like this, and then it's seven clean. Two of all the unclean, seven of the clean. And the reason for that is they're going to need to sacrifice the clean ones to be able to worship God. So they're going to need more of the clean ones than the unclean. And what's interesting is Moses, in writing this, does not explain the difference between clean and unclean. Because Israel already knows that, but how did Noah know? Noah had to know the difference between clean and unclean. So again, it goes back to that they knew more than what Genesis tells us. Because the distinction is made, but God doesn't tell what that distinction is in Genesis. And Moses doesn't have to, because Israel knows what that distinction is from Leviticus. Verse 22, Noah obeyed God completely. Thus Noah did according to all that God had commanded him, so he did. Verse 5, Noah did according to all the Lord had commanded him. So he obeyed the Lord, and they all got on the ark through that one door. You have them going in there through the door. don't know if they'd been that happy or not, but nonetheless, this is <laughs> one drawing of that. Moses repeated key information three times. It, uh, Noah obeyed. Verse 7, verse 5, I mean, and then in verse 9, there, there went into the ark Noah by twos, male and female, as God had commanded Noah. Verse 16, those that entered, male and female of all flesh, entered as God had commanded him. And the Lord closed it. The Lord closed the door, not Noah. Noah obeyed God while living among an entire world of people who completely opposed God. Everybody was against God. They did what was wicked all the time. We've seen that repeated. Genesis 7, 1, God Himself declared Noah righteous. Then the Lord said to Noah, Enter the ark, you all and your household, for you alone I have seen to be righteous before me in this time. Verses 2 and 3, Noah took on board in seven pairs, seven males and seven females of the clean animals needed for sacrifices. And again, clean and unclean isn't specified here, but Noah knows. Probably knows going back to with the first time God was 
giving the sacrifice to Adam, telling him how to do it. These are the type of animals I will accept. That's a deduction, but based upon what we've seen, that, that, that may be a possibility. Verse 4 through 5, again, Noah obeyed God exactly. He did exactly what God had told him to do. It's a key passage of studying Noah and his obedience. Because it's not going to quite be that way after. <laughs> Genesis 7, 6 through 9, Noah was 600 years old when God sent the flood to cover the earth. It's quite possible that it was 120 years of building it. Uh, as God says, my spirit will not strive. I'll give him 120 years. It may have been that time period, or it may have been uh, that he was talking about more of the lifespan of man. It's hard to say. But let's say it was 120 years, so Noah would be what, about 480. God tells him this. And I don't think it took him 120 years to build the ark. Uh, maybe he contracted some of it out. I don't know. But I think he was spent most of that time preaching the message of righteousness as a preacher of righteousness. But regardless, he is 600 years old when the Lord sent the flood. Noah and his family were on the ark for 371 days. And this is how we get this. 371 days. We're going to go through a little bit of the, the math of that here in just just a minute. God provided the details necessary to determine the length of their stay. You know, you're going to go on a trip. You need to know how much logistics you need. Noah was going to need to know this. And they're going to have to trust the Lord. Genesis 7, 11 through 12. First rain fell for 40 days. Rain fell for 40 days. In Genesis 7, 24, water continued to rise for 110 days, making a total of 150 days during which the flood waters rose. The water prevailed upon the earth 150 days. In Genesis 8, 4, six months after the flood began, the ark came to rest on Mount Ararat. In the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, the ark rested on the mountains of Ararat. So you got six months of floating... Then you're going to have another basically six months of sitting on the mountain. Art probably starting to smell kind of funny by at this point. All those animals on there. and everything. You know, Just imagine how they take care of the waste. How they take care, you know, how they do that. Had to be technological geniuses going on with this thing. If you've ever been to the Creation Museum in northern Kentucky, they have probable ways in which it was going on. They have models of it to show how it was possible, but we don't know. That's not why Moses is writing. Genesis 8, 5, 74 days later, the mountains were visible. The water decreased steadily until the 10th month. In the 10th month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains became visible. Note the detail here of the timing of the days and the months to show, just so we can know for certain how many days it is. 6 and 7, 40 days later, Noah sent out the raven. It came about at the end of 40 days that Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made and he sent out a raven and it flew here and there until the water was dried up from the earth. Verses 8 and 9, seven days later he sent the first dove. And then he sent out a dove from him to see if the water was abated from the face of the land but the dove found the resting place for the sole of her foot. So she returned to him into the ark for the water was on the surface of all the earth. And he put out his hand and took her and brought her into the ark to himself. Verses 10 and 11, seven days later, he sent the dove again. And it came back with an olive leaf in its beak. Now, as far as we can tell, in the midst of all of this, God hasn't spoken to him. He's having to trust the Lord through this whole time of being there on the ark, on the promise that I will make a new covenant with you. I will make a covenant with you, I should say. Verse 12, seven days later, he sent the dove again, and it did not return. Is it possible that he saw the mountains from the window? That's not telling us what God knew, but what he actually saw mm -hmm. as he looked out the opening. Right, that's what I think prompted him to send out the raven, as he right. sees. Yeah. You see what was going on to some degree. Yeah. Okay. And Mount Ararat today, I mean, it's pretty high. And altitude and all that kind of stuff, but while the seawater, while the water, you still have sea level, see? Mm -hmm. So that it's not a high altitude yet until the water gets lower and lower and lower mm -hmm. and when they come down off of it. 
8.13, 29 days later, Noah removed the covering from the ark. Now it came about in the 600 and first year, in the first month, on the first of the month, the water was dried up from the earth. Then Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, and behold, the surface of the ground was dried up. So they can get out and look around, but they don't go out yet. Verses 14 to 16, 50, 57 days later, after 371 days on the ark, God commanded Noah and his family to leave the ark. They didn't leave until God said so. And can you imagine those family discussions? Hey, Dad, look, man, there's dry land down there. Get off this thing. You know? No, we're going to wait for the Lord. So 371 minus 57 equals 314 days of the flood itself. And what you have at the end is you have a, basically a whole new planet destroyed, ready to grow back again. So in Genesis 7, 10 through 12, again, the rain began. 13 through 16, God himself shut the door to the ark. Moses used the literary device, synonymous parallelism, to emphasize information through repetition. Now this is interesting, just by the way of observation. Moses keeps employing different literary devices. He doesn't just keep doing inclusios like we saw before. He keeps using different things, word plays, poetry. He's a literary genius, having been trained in the, the house of Pharaoh. And he's using those things as he writes these. God the Holy Spirit working through him. Yes. But nonetheless, God the Holy Spirit working through what he has in his own ability to write. It's a masterful piece of literature the way Moses puts these things together. He placed importance on the separation between Noah's family and everyone else on the planet. He kept repeating, Noah is righteous, everybody else is wicked. Noah is righteous. And obeyed, everyone else was wicked, disobeying. He emphasized the animals to show that God preserved everything that had the breath of life. So this would include everything but the fish. And the other animals of the sea don't have to uh, get on the ark because they can breathe in the water. But the others, which got to include insects and all this time, you know, Imagine how great life would be if they'd have slapped one of those two mosquitoes. You know what I mean? <laughs> now, how did the Lord take care of that? Some have, uh, there's another theory that they didn't have to take them on the ark, but they lived it on the driftwood of the, that would have floated. Uh, who knows? Uh, we know God took care of it, and we got mosquitoes. Um, so <laughs> but nonetheless, uh, the Lord took care of all animal life. And he took care of human life through the family of Noah. The only way into the ark was through the one door, and God had himself shut it. Or, and God himself shut it. And there's a typology here. Again, only one way onto the ark, which was the method of deliverance. The same waters that floated the ark are the same waters that destroyed the earth. That's an interesting thing to think about with this one door. Because the same work that provides salvation also provides condemnation. Those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ are no longer under the wrath of God. Those who don't believe are still under the wrath of God. And so you have a typology here of the Lord Jesus Christ. He himself said, I am the door to the sheepfold. He said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. There was no other way of deliverance from the flood but on that one divine provision. It's the same way. There's no deliverance from the wrath of God except for the divine provision of the Lamb of God, a substitute. The same water that destroyed the antediluvian, that is, before the flood world, is the same water that flowed the ark above the destruction. In much the same way, Jesus Christ, who died for our sins, separated the whole human race into two parts. Those who accept Him as Savior or believe in Him as Savior and those who reject Him. All humanity is divided into those two positions. The basis of faith in God's appointed substitute. Genesis 7, 17 through 24, the worldwide flood had disastrous effects on the planet. 
You see that, and it says, Then the flood came upon the earth, verse 17, for forty days, and the water increased and lifted up the ark, so that it rose above the earth. The water prevailed and increased greatly. Verse 19, The water prevailed more and more upon the earth, so that all the high mountains everywhere under the heavens were covered. The water prevailed fifteen cubits higher. Verse 21, All flesh that moved on the earth perished. So he blotted out, verse 23, every living thing that was upon the face of the earth. The waters of the uh, the, the deep exploded. Some say, if you've ever looked at the ocean floor maps of, of the Pacific Ocean, it's like a zipper right there. Creation scientists like to think that's where it, all the water blew up from and then it got pieced back together by the Lord. I don't know. That's just Those guys are way smart. And um, they're looking at it from a creation perspective, trying to understand how it happened. So, you know, there's a certain level whether they may be right, but... There would have been great volcanic activity. We'll get to God remembered in just a minute. Let's take a look at this first. Volcanic activity, the eruption of the waters as the waters of the deep spewed forth. First time it ever rained, it never rained before. Imagine telling people, hey, it's going to rain. And God's going to destroy the earth with rain. What's rain, Noah? And why you got this boat in your backyard? I mean, there, there's no water for miles. And, and it would look ludicrous to the unbeliever. But what does God say the gospel is? The gospel's foolishness to, to those who are, are rejecting it. But to those of us who are saved by it, it's, it's life. It's, it's wisdom. So when this thing happens and destroys the planet, you would have rapid burial of all kinds of different, uh, whether it's animals or plant life. And this is what's going to lay down the fossil record. But what didn't get rapidly buried is going to end up either getting eaten up by the fish of the sea or is going to float. You know, when's the last time you saw something dead just sitting at the bottom of the ocean? Most of the time that doesn't happen. When you, when you had a goldfish as a kid and you knew it was dead because it's floating at the top, not floating down at the bottom. You know, dead things float. That's how it works. So the fossil record is going to be laid down rapidly. And you're going to get these layers of things taking place rapidly. Uh, tornado possibility, some, one uh, particular uh, super cyclone type stuff. Uh, maybe, I uh, don't know, but something is definitely doing uh, a lot of damage to the earth. And water itself, as you probably know, can damage things very quickly. Running water can erode things very fast. And so we come to the fish fossil here. See what happens how did this guy get here? You know, as far as we know, Fred, just a day in his life, you know, he got up that morning just to swim around, didn't know anything was coming. And so Fred's swimming along looking for minnows to eat or whatever, and all of a sudden, the earth erupts from the ocean floor and this whole mound of dirt comes to bury him on the ocean floor. And Fred is very seriously killed. He's graveyard dead there on the ocean floor or wherever it was uh, he was, whether it's in a, a, a pond or whatever it might be. And what you need for fossilization is not time so much as just the right conditions. I mean, they found fossilized top hats. How long have top hats been around? Not millions of years, you know, only a few hundred years. They find fossilized all kinds of different things. What you need is you need the right conditions. It's got to be organic. And it's got to be removed from the air and buried under the right conditions. And then in a matter of short period of time, you can have a fossil. So it's not a matter of thousands of years. It's a matter of just the right conditions. And the flood provided the right conditions for many things. That's why you find all types of plant fossil life on tops of mountains that are ocean plants. Because it's that ocean floor that rose up to become the mountain and the rapid burial of these organic plants as well as other life forms. It's very rare to find a full animal fossil because, again, most of those things would have gotten picked off by the fish or whatever, and it had to be in the right conditions for the rapid burial of the animals. But over time, we get this fossil. Somebody comes along, and see, this is what doesn't happen. You've got a dead fish at the bottom of the sea. He doesn't get buried gradually by the ocean floor and then gets fossilized. You got a dead fish on the bottom of the ocean floor, just hypothetically, let's say that happens, something going to eat it. 
This is free lunch. Didn't have to do anything for it. It's not going to have time to get buried so it's got the right conditions for a fossil. Beings of dead things, buried in rock layers, laid down by water all over the earth is what we'd expect to find if there was a global flood. And what do we find? Beings of dead things buried in rock layers all over the earth from the highest mountains to the lowest lows. That's exactly what we should expect. Verifies global flood. But coming with a presupposition that you don't want God to exist with evolution, you dig up a fossil. You say, wow, this fossil is millions of years. How do you know? Well, we found it in this rock layer. It's millions of years old. Well, how do you know that rock layer is millions of years old? Because we found this fossil that's millions of years old. Well, how do you know that fossil is millions of years old? Because this rock layer is millions of years old. You see, they're dating the fossils by the rock layer, but they're presupposing that they know what the rock layer, how old is it is, by the fossil that they know how old it is. Circular reasoning. And you can't get them to very rarely admit that, but the honest ones will. It's always nice to find an honest atheist that just, uh, to, I don't want God to exist. All right, I can talk with you. The others are the problems. They're trying to be deceptive about different things. But this is what we'd expect to find with a global flood, and that's exactly what we find. All right, let's keep moving. God remembered. That's what you need in uh, that blank of in Genesis 8, 1 through 3. God remembered in Genesis 8, 1, but God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the cattle that were with him in the ark. Now, when God remembers, it's not that he forgot. It's not that God sent the flood and went and played golf and, no, oh, Noah, yeah, I need to do something about him. When God remembers, he takes action. God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the cattle that were with him on the ark. The word remember, which is the word zakar in Hebrew, is grammatically in the cow imperfect. It means to think about or pay attention to. And whenever you see this word remember for God, he's about to take action. So what action does he take? What does he take? Verse 1 says, And God caused the wind to pass over the earth, and the water subsided. Also the fountains of the deep and the floodgates of the sky were closed, and the rain from the sky was restrained. So as a result, the water receded steadily from the earth. In the end of 150 days, the water decreased. So when God took action, he was doing away with the flood. He started to get things back going so Noah can get off the ark. God had not forgotten Noah by using this anthropomorphic idiom. An anthropomorphic idiom is assigning something of a human trait to God to help us understand. I mean, when we remember something... Usually, it's so we can do something. You ever had, you know, say, my wife will tell me, remind me to call the doctor tomorrow, change the appointment for the kid, uh, with whoever's coming up. What she's wanting me to do is give her a reminder to do something, to take action. That's usually what happens when we remember. We take action. You ever tie a string to your finger to remember to do something? My problem is I forget why the string's there. I know I'm supposed to, I've got this string here, but I can't remember what it was I was supposed to do. We remember because we're supposed to do something. When God remembers, He does something. And so He took action at the right time here, and it is described to us this way in terms we can understand. So we can understand it. He indicated that the right time had come for Him to take action to save Noah, that is, to get life going again. They've already been delivered from the flood. Now it's time to get things moving. Verse 4, rest is an important word in this verse, as the ark came to rest upon the mountains of Ararat. Note, the mountains, it's a mountain range. And there are some that uh, think they may have found it on that mountain range, and maybe they haven't. It. It's not going to shake my faith if they don't. It's going to verify it if they do. But it would not, uh, you know, I wouldn't get all caught up in it. Verses 5 through 14, the waters receded and the earth dried. And this is all the way through verse 14. We won't read through that. But when you get to verse 14, it says, The earth was dry. And then God spoke to Noah, saying, Get out. Go out of the ark. They got off the ark after more than a year on board. And one can only imagine what the planet looked like when they got off it. All the forests are destroyed. Uh, you know, it's going to take time for the vegetation to grow back. That's why you don't find a lot of a lot of things right away. They build houses out of the mud for a while because they don't have any lumber until the trees grow back. It takes time. 
20-22, Noah worshipped Creator God. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. The Lord smelled the soothing aroma and the Lord said to Himself, I will never again curse the ground on account of man. For the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth. And I will never again destroy every living thing as I have done. And He brings the witness... While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. So as we have a changing of the seasons, we have a reminder God's not going to destroy the earth this way. And we also have the rainbow that goes with it. We'll see that in just a moment. Now in Genesis 9, compared with Genesis 6, 18, and 9, 9, God made a contract with Noah called the Noahic Covenant. God said He would make a covenant with Noah, and in 9.9 9 says, Now behold, I myself do establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you. Moses wrote this information under the guidance of the Holy Spirit and after direct dialogue with God. Mo, uh, Noah is talking here with the Lord Himself. Remember, Moses was reared as royalty in the great Egyptian empire. Matter of fact, the writer of Hebrews tells us he didn't hold on to that. He didn't want to identify himself with the Pharaoh, but he did so with his people. But it infers he was a genius in many areas, including military tactics, music, engineering, and mathematics. I mean, after all, he was probably being trained to be the next Pharaoh, or at least been in running for it. So it would require all of this. Moses wrote several sections of the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, in the style of the covenant contracts of that time. He wrote the whole Torah, but some parts of it you can identify into these contracts, and we're going to have to kind of deal with that because so much of it relates to the contracts of the time. Lawyers can tell you, good lawyer, <laughs> I don't know, if that, that oxymoron? I don't know. <laughs> I've got two of my best friends are lawyers, so I can make fun of them. Uh, the, um, the, a good lawyer can tell you the kind of the timing of when a contract was written by the way it's written and the verbiage that's used in it, whether it was early 20th century, middle, you know, based upon the laws and those types of things. And that's what we're able to do here. Based upon contracts we found in archaeological digs and stuff of the same time period, we see the parallels between the contract there and the way things are written here. And it would fit the time period when Moses grew up. The main type of contract in Moses' day was the suzerain vassal treaty. Suzerain vassal treaty. This is going to get a little technical for a moment, but we need it to kind of grasp what's going on with these contracts or covenants. The suzerain vassal treaty was a mid second millennium, roughly 1500 BC secular treaty between a powerful king or empire and its vassal or servant state. So you have the suzerain as the king, the vassal as the servant. And again, 1500 B.C., this is the time of Moses. A lot in the Hittites uh, empire you have this suzerain-vassal treaty form. You also have land-grant treaties. A suzerain is a nation that controlled another nation, yet allowed it limited freedom to make decisions. A nation that controlled another nation, but allowed it limited freedom to make decisions. The vassal was a servant nation dominated by a greater empire. The vassal was described as an image or likeness of the great king. So you have the suzerain, you have the vassal. We're talking about nations more than we are people, although most of the time the suzerain nation was represented by the king, whether it be the Pharaoh or Abimelech or whoever it may be. Abimelech seems to be the Philistine title for a king, like Pharaoh for the Egyptians. Moses structured parts of the Pentateuch, or the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, in the suzerain vassal treaty style. It follows a certain pattern that matches the suzerain vassal treaty style. The suzerain vassal treaty usually began by identifying the great king. And Moses did the same thing with Genesis and Exodus. From Genesis 1-1 to Exodus 21-2, through he's giving Israel an understanding of who their suzerain is. And in doing so, he's giving them a history 
of what He's done for them in the past. He's reminding them. Remember, it's that generation getting ready to go into the land that Moses is instructing. Secondly, then a historical summary stated the relationship between the great king and his vassal. And in essence, Genesis 1-1 to Exodus 20 is the historical summary. In the same way, in Genesis 1-1 and in Exodus 19-2, Moses related the historic relationship between God and Israel. That should be encouraging for the Israelite getting ready to go into the land. His purpose was to emphasize God's goodness and kindness, or His grace and mercy, to His vassal nation Israel. Look what God has done for you. Why are you going to chase after these other gods who don't even exist when Creator God has done this? Remember who you are. This is kind of the idea. And who your God is. He wanted the vassal nation Israel to gladly accept its responsibilities and obligations to Him. He's redeemed them, and He's redeemed them for a purpose, just as God has redeemed us in Christ. We are saved by grace through faith, not of works, and we are saved as we are now His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand for us to walk in them. It's a walk of faith, just as it would be as we saw with Noah, we see with Abraham a little bit later, and so on. Then the treaty usually gave the obligations of the vassal nation to the suzerain or the great king. And that's where we get into what we consider to be the law. Exodus 19.3 through Numbers 10.10 lists the covenant requirements for the vassal nation Israel. It lists the covenant requirements for the vassal nation. The Lord says, if you will obey my commandments... You're going to be my priest nation to all the nations. These main rules and regulations form the covenant between God and the nation Israel. These main rules and regulations. Now if you're really, really interested in the Susan Vassal Treaty study, uh, uh, Dwight Pentecost done a book called God's Kingdom Program, I think is the name of it. He goes into great detail on these things. The treaty usually concluded with blessings and cursings. And that's where we get into with parts of Deuteronomy. Blessings came to those who kept the terms of the treaty. Cursings came to those who violated the covenant or the terms of the treaty. So we have blessings for obedience, if you will. Cursings for disobedience. Just as God said, if you do this, I'm going to do that. But if you do that, I'm going to do this. You know, you go after other gods, I'm going to cast you out of the land, which is what happened. It doesn't mean he's through with Israel, but he has cast them out of the property for the moment. Numbers 10 through 10, 11 through Deuteronomy 34, 12 spelled out the blessings and cursings to the vassal nation Israel and formed the historical conclusion section of the treaty. Now, these sections are not totally that cut and dry. Uh, You've got to understand there's some overlap and all of that, but just to kind of give you an idea how it follows the pattern of this type of treaty. So we we're into the conclusion section of the treaty. Now, God's format. The Susan Vassal style covenant used in the days of Moses followed God's original model. The only thing man can do is take what God has given and pervert it. And so I think this contract form, we're still pretty close to the time of the flood. If the flood happened in 2518, we're only a thousand years removed, but and you factor in it took a while before Babel and some other things to happen, it wouldn't be a surprise to see most of the world still operating on this type of contractual relationship, especially when you've only had a couple of empires to kind of grow up. And so I think this is God's original format. God did not draw on a human model to design His covenant with Israel. That wouldn't make sense. The human concept of a contract or treaty is rooted in God's original covenant with Adam in the garden. It's Hosea that calls it a a covenant with Adam. They'd broken the covenant. And biblical Christianity is interesting in that it's the only religious system, I don't really want to call it religion, but it's the only system where God involves Himself in a contract with His creatures. 
You don't find that anywhere else. You don't find God in anything else coming and making a contract. Because what's a contract for? Think about it for a moment. When you sign a contract, it spells out what you're getting, what your responsibilities are with it, and whoever it is you're making the contract with, the different parties. So that when this party fails to fulfill its end of the bargain, you can go and say, the contract says you were supposed to do A. You didn't do A, therefore B is happening to you. You can, you can check faithfulness. Well, we can check God's faithfulness by the contracts He's entered into. He's always faithful to keep His Word. He's not going to go back on His promises. And we see that in Deuteronomy 9.7. He is faithful to His Word. And also, we can go and see what we're supposed to do as well. Not only see what God's doing, but we can also see what we're supposed to do. That's what a contract or covenant is for. And only the biblical Creator God does this. We don't see that in anything else. God created Adam as the original vassal in the perfect environment of Eden. And Adam failed. Adam failed. And so just very quickly, these biblical contracts, we have the Edenic Covenant, Genesis 1, 28-30, same language that we're going to find uh, with the Adamic Covenant and then of course with the Noahic Covenant. Very similar language here and here. And really, these are addendums to the original. God has to make an addendum here because man has failed. God has to make an addendum here because man has failed again and put it, put it in the Noahic Covenant. One key thing to note, it's the introduction of human government. If we look at Genesis 9, <clears throat> verse 1, And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Now, we've seen that before. It was in Genesis 1. The fear of you and the terror of you will be on every beast of the earth and on every bird of the sky with everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea into your hand they are given. Every moving thing that is alive shall be food for you. I give all to you as I gave the green plant. Now that's interesting with you're an Israelite. Because can they eat any food they want to? No. And yet God says I, gave, I give it all to you. Now later on, he'll pull that back with Peter. The three times a sheep comes down and says, hey, take and eat, take and eat, take and eat. Well, that's later on. But for Israel, that would have been, wow, really? And yet, they were to eat kosher, if you will, according to what Levitical law put forth. Now, verse 4, there is a prohibition, and you find the same prohibition in Leviticus. Only you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. The thing here is you're not to eat the flesh with the blood pulsating like a lion, like an animal does. You know, when a, an, when a lion tracks down a, a zebra or gazelle and kills it, he doesn't put it in the freezer and come back later. It chows down right then. The blood's still warm. That's how an animal kills and eats. We're to drain the lifeblood out of it. There's a certain respect for the animal because that animal, think about this, that animal has died so that you can live. Not in a sense of spiritually, but physically. And there's something to that. And I think we lose that in our modern culture. You know, back in the day when you killed your own chicken, when you raised your own hogs, or you raised your own cattle, and you slaughtered them yourself, you learn something. You learn something about death. You learn something that, you know, Bessie here, who I've raised from a, you know, a calf up, and now I've got to kill her. She's dying so I can eat and live. It teaches something about what is necessary for us to have the right relationship with God. I think we lose something in our modern society because of that. Anyhow, he says, you don't eat it with the lifeblood in it. And then he puts forth the uh, principle of human government by the greatest thing that human government can do in protecting man is capital punishment. He says, Surely I will require your lifeblood from every beast I will require of it. And from every man, from every man's brother, I will require the life of man. Whoever sheds man's blood, an idiom for murder, by man his blood shall be shed. It's to be taken. The life is to be taken. Because, note, not to give you know, the victim some sort of something, but it's for the image, in the image of God he made man. Which tells us now, even after the fall, even after the flood, there's still an image-bearing aspect of man in him. As for you, be fruitful, multiply, populate the earth abundantly, and multiply in it. And then, 
verse 11, we skip down, it says, I will establish my covenant with you, and all flesh shall never again be cut off by the water of the flood, neither shall there again be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the sign of the covenant which I am making between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all successive generations. I set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a, for a sign of a covenant between me and the earth. So here we have this new physical entity in the post-flood world called the rainbow that is seen in heaven. There, in the visions of Ezekiel, they see a rainbow around the throne of heaven. And you, so when you see a rainbow, you're getting a glimpse of something that's in heaven in some way, somehow, that didn't exist before the flood. And God has now put it in the sky to remind us that we can eat meat and kill the criminal. Because that's what's in the contract. You can eat the cow now, and you can execute the criminal. And when you see a double rainbow, that's a biblical basis for going back for seconds. Okay? Look like you needed to be woken up a little bit after all that Caesar and Vassal Treaty stuff. So, No, no, the double punishment on uh, uh, that one. <laughs> Abrahamic covenant is the next one we're going to see, and then, of course, the Mosaic covenant. These are, um, are uh, what we would call unconditional. This one's going to be, have a condition on it, and we'll talk about some of those differences a bit later. All right, now Genesis 9, 18 through 29, Noah cursed Canaan. Now, <clears throat> Noah lives, what, to be 900? 600 when the flood uh, comes. So 300 years. Do you think there's some other events in the life of Noah during those 300 years behind him getting drunk and getting in his tent? I think there is. But Moses is very selective. Why would it be important to put in here this event where Noah curses Canaan? They're going into the land of Canaan. And they're going into the land of Canaan to carry out judicial punishment on them. And so this would be an important aspect for them to understand where this all begins. Genesis 9, 20-21, through 21, there's no way around it, Noah sinned. Verse 20, Then Noah began farming and planted a vineyard. He drank of the wine, became drunk, and covered himself inside his tent. Now there's no way to get around it. There's sin here. A lot of people like to say it was a sin of ignorance. I don't buy it. Uh, but he is sinning. And exactly what it is on his uncovering himself in his tent, there's a lot of debate on that. We don't need to get into that. But what we do know is Ham disrespects his father. Sham and Japheth do not. Verses 22 and 23, Ham disrespected his father. But Ham, the father of Canaan, and that's emphasized that Ham is the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his brothers outside. You know, you can imagine that, hey, guess what, guess what dad's done, you know, and going out and telling them. But Sham and Japheth, note, how, note the details of this, took a garment and laid it upon their shoulders and walked backward and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were turned away so that they did not see their father's nakedness. They show him respect. They go out of their way to make sure they don't see him and cover him up out of respect. Ham didn't do that. Now exactly what all it is that's going on, there's some other things that may be involved as well, but the key thing is Shem and Japheth respected their father. Verse 24 and 25, Noah expected Canaan to repeat the sinful traits of his father Ham. So when Noah awoke from his wine, that means he sobered up, he knew what his youngest son had done to him. But he doesn't curse Ham. He doesn't curse the son, he curses the grandson. Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants, he shall be to his brothers. He also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth, and let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be a servant. And what you have here is a microcosm of the rest of human history as far as the major civilizations are concerned. The Hamitic, Semitic, and Japhetic civilizations. And how that's going to play itself out in history. The virtues and vices of Noah's sons became the virtues and vices of the families of the world. The prophecy, however, focused on Canaan. 
Again, that's what would be interesting to the Israelites. The prophecy will be fulfilled with the Canaanite people, not with Canaan himself. It's going to be fulfilled when the Israelites come to conquer the land of Canaan. Many rightfully argue this passage explains in part God's reason for allowing Israel to take the land of the Canaanites. There's got to be a reason why Moses puts it in here, and it would be giving them the history that goes all the way back to why these Canaanites are to be conquered, because God has told them, annihilate them. He hasn't told them, go on there and just, you know, get rid of some and play jacks with the rest. He's told them to kill them all. And it's, it's a uh, holy war that's eventually called off. But nonetheless, while it was going on, that's what they were to do. Genesis 9.26, Shem was blessed because of his willing heart toward Yahweh. The promised spiritual blessing was completely fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. The, the seed's going to get narrowed down. It's going to go now from Noah to Shem, then eventually uh, through Shem's descendants to Terah, to Abraham, and then Isaac, Jacob, Judah, all the way on, we get to David, and then all the way down, down till the birth of Messiah. Genesis 9.27, Japheth would multiply and be blessed by his association with Shem. And Japheth's going to enlarge. He's going to have some of the largest land that's going to be mostly what we would call Europe and those of the Japhetic people groups. I have a switch... Our points. And we come to Babel. Creation, fall, flood, Babel. Genesis 10 is the table of nations. This is where when you're reading through your Bible, you get to about Ripeth and Dagarma and Katim and you, ah, let's jump over to chapter 11. A lot of names here, but this is a historical document that traces out where who the people groups are, and in some cases where they went. Genesis 10, 1 through 5 provides us with Japheth's descendants. It's probably settled Western and Northern Europe. The Indo European languages come from the Japhetic groups. And there's this group of guys called Euhemerus. They're not I don't think there's any love. Guys like Alexander Hislop and uh, I forget the other main guy's name. But anyhow, uh, that guy's name. Anyhow. They, they did research on all this, tracing out the names and, and tracing out where these things, where these people settled and that kind of stuff. It's, it's, it gets very detailed. And, and they, they didn't have cable, so they didn't have anything else to do. So this is what they were working on, working through all those times and digging into this. And they've traced it out. And it's pretty much uh, something that can be trusted to a certain degree. You just don't want to be too dogmatic about it. But they can trace out where all these guys went to. Genesis 10, 6-20, Ham became the father of the Asians, Egyptians, and possibly Indians. And, and that would be uh, the American Indians. Matter of fact, some will argue that Ham is the first pharaoh of Egypt. Because they live a long time. Now that lifespan is about to drop after the flood. But those close by, they're, this, they're still living a long period of time. I mean, Abraham lives 180 years. Uh, so some say that, and maybe, maybe not. But here's a map shows where everybody went. Japheth up here in the red. Shem, pretty much what we'd call today the Middle East. And then Ham on into Africa and, and cross. And, of course, there's overlap. Uh, they could have gone out this way uh, on into Asia, or they could have gone in this direction uh, and gotten there, sailing, what have you. But this is where... Uh, most will say these things go and note the little little box you got all the ites there which are the ones that in the land of canaan and then the key one to note right here is shinar because that's coming up because it's in the plain of shinar that we have the building of the tower of babel in genesis 10 8 through 11 cush was the father of nimrod who became a powerful leader and there's a change in the narrative when you get to him Verse 8, now Cush became the father of Nimrod. He became a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Erech and Akkad and Kalna in the land of Shinar. 
So it's likely that he's possibly the leader of this Babel event. From that land he went forth into Assyria and built Nineveh, and Rehoboth, Ur, and Kalah. And Rosam between Nineveh and Kalah, that is the great city. Now here's just something to think about. How do you get to be a mighty hunter after the flood? Possibly killing off T-Rexes or Triceratops, you know, those types of things. I think that's possible. Again, that's a deduction. But, you know, just because you kill a bunch of deer or because you kill the big old, you know, things there and start wiping them out, you know, just something to think about. There's some that are very dogmatic about that, uh, not so dogmatic about it, but it is something to consider. Genesis 10, 21 through 31. Shem became the father of the Semitic people groups. Israel was from Shem. And so when Moses gives them to us here, he starts with Japheth, then Ham and Shem. He doesn't do Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Again, he's focusing us on the descendants of Shem in this event. But one thing to keep in mind, there are no race distinctions. There's one race. We all descended from Adam and Eve, eventually uh, through Noah, and one of the sets of his sons and daughters. You know, people like to talk about their ancestors. I got real famous when he built a big boat once. You know, and we all got the same one. See, the idea of race, that is an evolutionary concept. And it is an evolutionary concept for the purpose of divide and conquer. And this is what dominated Germany with, with Hitler's racism and stuff to start the master race. It's built on an evolution perspective, not on a biblical perspective. Biblically, we have different people groups in their cultures, but we're all descended from the original image bearers. Yeah, oh yeah, 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 yeah. New Testament connection. Yeah, back then books had titles that lasted, you know, like eight lines. <laughs> yeah. The New Testament connection. Acts 17, 26 through 27 gives the biblical philosophy of history. When Paul, again at the Areopagus, we mentioned that earlier this morning, he says, I see you guys are religious in many respects. You've got an altar even to the unknown God. Let me tell you about Him. He says in verse 24, The God who made the world and all things in it, since He is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is He served by human hands as though He needed anything, since He Himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, note, having determined their appointed times and boundaries of their habitation. God's going to set up where they settle geographically. This would be huge for the Greeks because of where, you know, the geography of, of Greece. I taught history for six or seven years, and this was always the first place I'd start, is with this passage. Because I could, in the school I was in, I could teach it from a biblical perspective. And then we build our history from this. And he does this for purpose. Note verse 27. That they would seek God, if perhaps they might grope for Him and find Him, though He's not far from each one of us. God sets up the geographical locations of the people groups of the earth to maximize God consciousness. And what God does in history is based upon what He's doing, what, what Paul says here about this. And what we're looking at, getting ready to look at with Babel, is when this happens. Paul presented the biblical worldview. God has authority over creation. God creates national boundaries so the people within those nations can best come to know about Him. The reason God wants to do this is because He wants all to come to repentance. Now, that doesn't mean all will, but John 3.16 says that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever will believe, whoever wants to, may have eternal life. That's possible. Well, He always has, throughout church history, He's always had a bastion for the truth where missionaries can go out. And so far, this, this continent is still it. may not be for much longer. Yeah, you look at Britain, been by sure, sure, sure. 
right? Yeah, exactly. Well, that's because of our biblical worldview founding. You know, it wasn't a complete biblical worldview, but it was pretty good. No doubt. And he's, that's how he gets the message out is through that nation. Sure. God designed the rise and fall of nations to encourage people to recognize him. And see, that's what's going to happen to a nation that's been blessed and then refuses to recognize where those blessings come from. Well, God's got to get the attention. And that may be what we're seeing in some events taking place in our own time. All right, let's take a uh, break right there. We'll come back.